we we have to get back to writing we need to kind of because of the the parent meeting and they have a parent meeting for the you want a mic? I am trying. I would try. Sure. I would nature of sin cause us Father cause us to recognize when we deceive ourselves and make us victorious over sin that causes us to stumble and bloodies our walk and does disgrace to your name Father, we pray, especially this evening, for the monies, those that are hurting. And so, Father, we, we ask we ask for restoration, for physical health. We would pray, Father, it would please you to restore Gordon. And we're thankful for his testimony. And the testimony of grace around their entire family and their hearts are still aching and praying. <coughs> so we trust you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you heard any more? Anybody? About Gordon? No? Okay. Just he he was gonna be they were gonna extubate, hopefully. Take the breathing. Sure, please. Okay. But he's on the respirator and they wanted to undo that, hopefully. I didn't know. I that was the last like about three thirty. Here. Last message from Dan. Dean, yep. <laughs> Oh yeah, he's, um, so I looked, Daniel, okay Lord, what are you gonna tell me in this message? Because we all knew it was. Okay, so <clears throat> here we are at Ephesians 6, and earlier, beginning back at verse 10, he talks about our being uh, in in a battle, and we need to, we need God's strength for this battle. And He commands us to be clothed with 
the totality of the armor God has provided for us to fight against Satan. This is 2,000 years ago. It's true. It's true today. We still need that. Verse 12, he qualifies the nature of this battle. He says we aren't fighting against other humans as much as we're fighting against the demonic forces behind human ideas that are contrary to God. So he says, we're fighting against demons. In verse 12, we're fighting against demons. In verse 12, and we're fighting against demons. In verse 12, I think there might be a progression there from like uh, local area demons, and that to world rulers, he says at the end. And then because of this, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God. Dan Rondo asked what that meant. And I think that means being prepared to suit the nature of the case. In this battle, and like uh, a soldier would get ready, like a, a catcher would get ready, <clears throat> I was, I was thinking about uh, <coughs> Johnny Bench because I hated the big red machine because they were so good. <laughs> and Johnny Bench diving for a wild pitch fast ball from Jack Billingham and using his mitt and not being afraid. He's not afraid to reach out his hand with a mitt for a 100 mile an hour fastball because of the nature of that battle, but he was equipped, so, so it didn't hurt. <clears throat> I was catcher for several years playing baseball, and before I reached out with my mitt, I would reach out with my bare hand. <clears throat> this is foolish, and you learn how to fight better with the equipment you've been given. So we have to take up this armor and all of it and, and do battle. And now we come into verse 14 and he says, stand, stand. And I've numbered three participles here and you studied these last week with Pastor Jay. And so we'll go through this, I'll, I'll try not to just restate everything, but the, the nature of the first attack, this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it a metaphor and not an allegory, because I don't, I don't think it's an allegory like Paul would use in Galatians to talk about uh, the difference between Sarah and Hagar. Sarah and Hagar, and he, he makes an allegory, but we've got a metaphor with warfare involved, but it's not a physical kind of warfare, but he's using something familiar to us to make sense of the severity of the case, and therefore, of, Kate, of course, ties us back into the nature of the warfare, whom we're fighting against. Uh, I mentioned that we, we we're blind in this battle. And these are some of the goggles, some of the night vision, if I can expand on that, that God, God has given us to fight this with an enemy we can't see, with weapons we can't see, because these are ideas that we're fighting, wrong ideas. And if truth is the first item in this belt that we have that ties together at least our frontal armor, then what's the attack? The attack is lies, and the worst kind of lie, lies are deception. And so we're looking at, at lies that are, that are terrible because we don't know. And like uh, Pastor Jay mentioned last week in Isaiah, we're told that you know, God has this kind of coat of mail in Isaiah 59. I'll just, I'll just read just quickly. Truth is lacking, 
and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Not prey, but Ewa prey. You become the hunted. Truth is lacking, and it's interesting that this shows up first. I, I wonder whether Paul is, is really, really reaching back for this. But if you do this, you become a target. He says in Isaiah, wait, that was 700 years before Christ. So we're getting like 3,000 years into this kind of battle over truth. Truth is at stake. It's not just our opinion. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. So justice and truth walk hand in hand here. He saw there was no that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. And then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. Scripture talks about creation being finger play, right? Just, but salvation requires real strength on God's part. His whole arm, as he makes that analogy, he put on a right, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing. We're going to reclaim what was taken. And what was taken in Isaiah was truth. And this is what we're fighting against. This is one of those tactics that the enemy uses against us. And God is fighting this for, and it goes back, all sin we see going back all the way to Genesis. Genesis 3 and the same kinds of tactics. It was a tactic going against the truth and wrapped himself in zeal, zeal as a cloak. You've seen this word before, zeal, and we see the word zealous sometimes. What's the difference between zeal and, or jealous and zealous? What do you think? something you have as long as something you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's pretty good, pretty good. But zealous is some real intense passion. And God is not going out to war to reclaim truth and have righteousness because he just, oh, those poor dear souls. No, he's going into battle, which means if he's going to battle, he must have not just a cause, but someone who's violated that cause and an enemy an enemy and we don't have it right in our culture today thinking oh you have your way I have my way I'm okay you're okay I haven't ever read that book but it was popular I guess in the 70s I'm okay you're okay mm -mm. that's not true according to their deeds so will he repay Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands. He will render repayment, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Okay, question. When you look out your bedroom window in the morning, which direction does the sun rise? It always rises in the east, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what they, he said, from the west to the east, he will be glorified. From the west to the east, he forgets our sin. We can't even forget our sin, but he won't bring it up and build a monument to our sin against us. Over and over after it's been put away. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. Okay, so God's attitude is zealous in this war. In a bad way, we would say he's loaded for bear. He's not loaded for squirrels. He's loaded for bear, and he's happy about it. 
but he's angry at sin. And how many times do we face outright lies during the day? And we just let it go. And this is something that we have fastened on because we're equipped. We take this up, and this is how we stand. If we don't stand for the truth, if we don't take a stand for the truth against ideas that the enemy proposes to us in deceptive ways that we don't know until it happens most of the time, if we don't screw ourselves into the ground and not move there, what's the alternative? It's there. Okay, so there's no middle ground, is there? It's true or it's lies. There's no, what do we, there's no neutrality. There's no neutral ground in any warfare. This is unconditional surrender the enemy demands of us. But they don't say that. Did God really say you would not die? It's deception. And we, oh, it's, it's unbelievable. So we have to prepare to defend against deceptive lies we don't see from an enemy we don't see. But we recognize the lies and the truth exposes that and keeps us all put together. If we did not have this understanding of the battle, why would we, in our sin, ever choose the truth? We would. This is the deception, isn't it? Come on, the people who cheat on their taxes have more money. So just cheat. It's not neutral. They have all the money they need. The government doesn't have any money. It's not political. I'm just saying. The government doesn't have any money. They have all our money. But it's that kind of deception. It's subtle, and we, we, don't, we don't recognize it. So if we could get away with lying, the true deception comes when we see the world the flesh, the world, and the devil, and his enemies, or, or his cohorts, all coming at once after us in this attack on truth. It comes in an instant. We have our own deception. I, we really want this. No, I can't do it. And then the world brings a commercial for you, or a billboard. <clears throat> And you're invited to things you know you ought not to have. It's a lie. I think, I think it's Proverbs 24. Don't, it's 24 or 25 because it was Thanksgiving Day and you're studying that in the car on the way to Grandma's. And God talks about how appealing, how appealing what the wicked have appears to be. And ill-gotten gain. Don't don't look there now. I'm going <clears throat> short circuit memory as I get it a little bit older here. Five weeks ago at the ACCS conference, American Classical Christian Schools Conference in Pittsburgh, Rosaria Butterfield was commenting on the Blues Clues Pride Parade. Do you know what Blues Clues is? I didn't. I see this little blue dog hopping out. What's Blue's Clues? Oh yeah, I've seen that dog. That's harmless. Mm. A Pride Parade Day sing-along with a drag queen named Nina West. I feel, if it wouldn't have said drag queen, I would have been just as ignorant. Singing, and then I had to look. What is it? The ants go marching along, that's a tune. And 10 verses of every Letter you want, past the plus in the LGBT, and everybody's okay. All right. Children sit spellbound by the animation in these shows. They don't know any better, and we correct them 
oh, the TV, you know, that's not right for the TV. But those images stay, and the song stays. The deception is there, and we fight it and fight it and fight it. And you still have memories from your childhood watching television, and oh yeah, and I remember Ozzy Osbourne 34, 35 years ago showing up on Sesame Street. Guess what we didn't ever watch again? Not that I cared for Sesame Street that much, but ooh, let's find out. And click. We didn't have a remote back then. <laughs> no, why do I want my anybody? I don't want Ozzy Osbourne had an influence of any kind over my children. But we've got all sorts of episodes like this that are going on, hammering our, our children. Joe Biden comments at the White House. Ceremony, March 31st. This is not political. This is a point about deceptive lies our enemies put out in front of us. And listen to how subtle this is. And I don't think, I pray God will save our president. I don't think he has a clue, not just because he's old. Er, old er. March 30, I'm getting older, I have to be careful about that. Because I'm still 27, you know what I mean. March 31st, 2023 is the National Day of Transgender Visibility. On that day, President Biden said on, uh, he said, this is our Transgender Day of Visibility. We want you, transgender people, to know that we see you just as you are, made in the image of God and deserving of dignity, respect, and support. Okay, the first party got right. It was true. They're made in the image of God. Is there dignity in what they do? Can, can you... Can you support that? You wanted to know, President said, President Biden said, if others believe this too. You wanted to know if there really is a national holiday, I'm sorry, in the United States called Transgender Day of Visibility. You expected Christians to be in conflict with the world. Say what? A, a celebration day for this? And you expect Christians to be in conflict with that. But did we expect Christians to be in conflict with other Christians about this? This is deception about the truth that comes in on TV and your friends talk. And oh my goodness, why? You wonder. Are there differences? Are these differences dividing the church? You wonder if my enemies are Christ's enemies. And if Christ is not divided, why are enemy lines drawn within Christianity on issues the Bible speaks so clearly about, like homosexuality, feminism, paganism, transgenderism, and the inherent ontological differences between men and women? I'll tell you why, because we're in a war with the enemy we can't see, producing evil that corrupts the truth with lies we don't recognize until it's too late. What, what's a lie? Uh, a, a lie is the, the deception wrapped in the skin of the truth. In the youth group, we do, uh, what are the apples? Not bobbing for apples, apples, uh, Halloween. Caramel apples, caramel apples, everybody loves those. And then on one youth group activity, you'll do a caramel onion. onion. There you go, <laughs> man after my own heart. A caramel <laughs> onion, and you bite into that caramel onion, and the texture is the same, but you take your first breath and you say, something's wrong with this apple. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with the apple. Because it's not an apple, but you bit in and it looks so good. And oh my goodness. Ephesians 4, two chapters earlier, he says, He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints. We are equipped with this whole armor to fight. 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So we build each other up in this until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. So it's, it is human cunning and craftiness. It's me. You want to know what's wrong with the world? I am. Because I'm deceived most of the time, and I'm happy to walk away, get in my own way in my sin. So there's no middle ground. It's true or it's not. And oh, you're just being so fussy. If someone suggests that to you, say, well, if we run with the trans, this and that and the other, <clears throat> how are those children going to know how to live in a family? Unless they reject it. For what? For the truth. If they don't reject it, how long do we have before we don't have any more babies? And we don't flourish. This is... Do the math. Right? Do the math. It just isn't going to happen. So we've got to fight against this. But we deceive ourselves, believing the lie of getting away with our sin, the fruits the world tells us we deserve. We used to say, take it seriously as a heart attack. <laughs> Scripture says, take this idea seriously as unconditional terms of surrender and warfare. Because if you don't, you are going to die. Our friends are going to die. People we love, we want God to save are going to die. And it's all bound together. We're defending against the lies with the truth. And there is nothing else that can fight against a lie. I know, but Paul does that. So, and, and, we put on, we put on the belt of truth, buckle it around our waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Right by the and, would you do me a favor and just put a plus sign there? So this is one. And two, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So, again, uh, we fastened on the belt of truth. This is the means God has for us being able to stand. And it's also the cause for us to be able to stand. And we put on the breastplate of righteousness. What's the root of this word, righteousness? Right. Right. <clears throat> Consistent with the truth. Consistent with what's true. True is an idea. Right. Right. And righteousness is practice, isn't it? James said, you claim, you claim to be a believer and you have no works. Right? That applies here too. You claim to be right, but there's no works that follow. So, our walk has to match our talk. So this, and without truth, without righteousness, you can't even have hypocrisy, can you? Oh, you're just such a hypocrite. Yes, me too. But if we don't have truth, there is no hypocrisy. If there's no righteousness, if there's not anything right, how can you be a hypocrite to it? You can't. And this God talks about as being warfare. This is warfare. So, I don't have time, but Romans 3, 25, 325. We have to go back to 19, but I can't because we don't have time. God sent Christ and we are justified as a gift by the redemption that God had in Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood 
to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. God's rightness. God defines the rightness, and he displays it. And he does it for a couple of reasons. In Romans 3, he says, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins, but this was done now to show his righteousness, a second time, at the present time so that he might be, what? Just. Just, but guess what the Greek word is? Right, righteous. So that he might be just, so that he might be righteous, and the justifier, the one declaring righteous, the one who has faith in Christ. So, why would you ever hope that you would have a right standing with God? Did he just say, oh, you know, you're all right. I forgive you. On a whim? Then someone else is going to say, hey, how does he rate? What's, what's wrong with me? Aren't my works good enough? But God is just himself. No one can charge God with unrighteousness in giving grace to those who believe in Christ. This is the issue. It's true. God defines what truth is, and truth and righteousness are part of our ultimate commitment to him. And it's also used here to describe the righteous life lived in obedience to the will of God. So the holy standard biblical worldview results in a holy batch, fruit, cornucopia of righteous behavior from the root to the fruit because God changed our nature. And he's told us in kindness that this is the battle that's going to go on. That this is the battle that's going on and who our enemy is. And, plus sign, sorry I didn't want to go back for the red. As shoes for your feet, having put on shoes for your feet, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. <clears throat> the first thing that came to mind, cleats. Now we're digging in, because now I'm fighting against you. But what? What am I fighting with? I heard preachers a long, long time ago, well-meaning, I'm sure, and maybe I've gone too far. If I've gone too far, please, <clears throat> Talk to me openly about it since I'm saying it openly. There's only one offensive weapon in all the panoply of God. And you've heard that sermon too. And what is it? The sword. But what's the gospel? Isn't this, is this offensive? Don't hit me. I believe in Jesus. Don't hit me. You should believe in Jesus too. No. This is offensive. I mean, like offense, offensive, not Not, what's a better word? <clears throat> Loathsome. Not that kind of offensive. Get away. No, this is active engagement with the enemy because we have a human enemy empowered by supernatural enemies and we have truth, we have righteous conduct that enables to, us to go and we are already prepared. Readiness. I'm ready to go. Okay, so I run in. It's, it's the end of the inning, and I'm catching. Get your gear up. Phil is out warming up the pitcher for you, and i got to go get myself ready. Sometimes I would walk out, and I'd forget my shin guards when I was eight. <sighs> you only do that once in your shins. I think I still have a scar. But the gospel... The gospel is how we're digging in with the metaphor of the warfare. We, we have protection, our belt, our girdle, our breastplate is all secure, and now our feet are prepared already with readiness. The gospel, look, given the gospel of peace gives this readiness. 
Now, Dan Rondo, how do you define of? From. Here. From. Okay, given by the gospel from peace? Dan thinks this way, so I'm not picking on him. He's the <laughs> gospel it's of a description. peace. It's a, it's, it's a description. Would we say the peaceful gospel? No. No. So that doesn't that doesn't make sense in the idea or the way to say it. Do, how about would the gospel? Wait, wait a minute. If we're coming with the gospel in this progression forward. Peaceably, but but we're set up for warfare. Would we come not just with a truce flag? We aren't coming with a truce flag. No. We're coming because the gospel will produce peace with an enemy and convert an enemy into someone God calls his family, his son, or his daughter. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Like the rest, we were dead. And he makes us alive in Christ. And so this is aggressive. There, there's my word. Aggressive for offensive instead of disgusting. So the gospel of peace does this. Now, we are at verse 15 now, right? 15. Okay, this is 6, 15. So I want you... To look at another verse 15 in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Go there quickly, quickly, please, because we, we don't have much time. We're prepared. And you know, by means of preparing ourselves in another way, with an announcement, the gospel that produces peace, but not to demonic enemies, human enemies. What are we hoping to get? What are we hoping to get with the gospel? Human believers, fish. Human believers, fish. Mm, different metaphor. Good one, but a different metaphor. We want captives. We want to take prisoners. We want to take prisoners and lead them back to Christ. And you know what? They're going to recognize and repent for a long time over wrong thinking. And then that's going to produce changes in their practices because it's not consistent with truth the way God defines it and displays it for us. And Peter says almost the same thing here. First Peter 3, look at verse 13, just to back up in the context a little bit. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer, not you ought to should, but if this would happen to you, for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord as holy. He set all of this up, this battle, this warfare. Set him up as holy. Always. Well, I'm almost done. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. What's the reason? You have this hope in Christ. Be prepared for this. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, we're doing battle. We might be charged. Here, someone's challenging our behavior and our ideas quickly. Having a good conscience. Oh, I'm sorry. The end of verse 15 is aggressive, but it's not disrespectful. He says, do this with gentleness and respect. Now we can hold out a piece, a truce flag and say, you asked, may I answer? I got an answer for you. Did you want to hear it or is that okay? And you're going to be gentle and respectful to, your, to those who are holding you prisoner. Acts 16, yes? The Philippian jailer. But Peter says, do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior 
in Christ may be put to shame. Our goal is not to put them to shame. Our goal is to give them an answer in the gospel of peace that will rightly relate them to God. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than your suffering for doing evil. And then I'll leave you for next week. The last element is the shield besides the sword. Shields are defensives. They're, they're used um, as figure of speech for whatever will, will block, it will block against. And here it's our faith. What does it mean about faith? I want to suggest in this context, Paul says the faith is our ultimate commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ as our God and Savior through his explanation in the scriptures concerning truth, righteousness, sin, and judgment are what Paul means by this use of the term faith and study. Father, help us not compromise by giving in to our enemy, so making ourselves your enemy. Father, help us defend our grandchildren and our grand, our, our children who are raising their children with these truths so that we will ever be vigilant and the next generation that faith in particular, would be equipped and prepared for this battle and that you would save many souls and grow them here in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're good. go into this time of prayer, Dan would, Dan Rhonda, would you continue us by just praying this text right now, and then we're going to continue on praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together to study your word. We thank you for the wisdom that you've granted our teachers. Uh, we pray that you would just keep us, keep us ready, keep us standing. Fasten the belt of truth on us and put on, uh, <clears throat> teach us to put on the breastplate of righteousness and be ready with the shoes on our feet and the <clears throat> gospel of peace and we can do that. Just continue to teach us in this passage and keep us, uh, keep us equipped in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, before we go into to continue and work this worship and prayer and the word, I, I want to give two things out and just keep moving on. I, I get these from the chapel library. I've mentioned this free ministry of resources that's just awesome as it goes back to old sources that are fresh and lively. The first that I want to mention is I bought two of these. I'm going to read the other one I have at home. I'm willing to give this out as a homework assignment to one of you that says, hey, I resonate with that. I'd like to read this. This is called the Amen in Public Worship. You ever thought, you know, and all God's people said? Amen. That's pretty good. Um, and all God's people said? Amen. This, this is written by Abraham Booth in 1730. From, he lived in the late 1700s. As he talks about this word, Amen, and how it should be applied to the way we think and live and even practice in worship. I'd love for someone to say, Hey, I'd like to read that in order. And if you say you'll read it, you have to send me at least a quote or a thought that came from your reading. 
in a text or an email. Someone willing to do that? Nobody's willing. To do that. No <laughs> Scott is willing to do that. Scott, uh, and then the other one, we're going to pray for Gordon and Dorothy tonight. Um, here, Thomas Brooks, <coughs> old Thomas Brooks, was a Puritan from the 1600s. I love him. I, I don't know if you guys remember when I was preaching in the Psalms and I mentioned the mute Christian under the smarting rod. He wrote many things, and one of them was a sermon called A Believer's Last Day, His Best Day. Isn't that a great title? The, and he talks about the doctrine of hope in death, and then, like a, every Puritan would do, practical application. And he, here's the practical application if you think about the Christian view of death. Mourn moderately. Do not fear death. Prepare for death. And ponder the worst day for the wicked. And this is, this is a sober, but I think a glorifying God and faith-building sermon. Would anybody like this sermon? I'd love to give this to someone. Julie. Is that this month? The, no, it, this is just one of resources I ordered specifically. Each month they give a theme and it has many messages. Okay, uh, we're going to pray. And one of the ways we want to express our prayer is singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In this, in this case, a hymn. And I pray that God would stir our hearts towards prayer and towards God, who is the truth. And in whom is our righteousness. And, and so we're going to sing the solid rock. And, and sometimes when you tweak a word here or there, it like it brings more meaning because you emphasize and you think about it more. So I took this hymn and I changed where it was first person singular. My hope is built. And I made it into a plural. Our hope is built. So let's sing this together corporately. I think enough of you know this old hymn. Let's, let's do this. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, we rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, our anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support us in the whelming flood. When all around our souls give way, He then is all our hope and say. Let's stop there. Think about that. When all around our souls give way, He then is all our hope and stay. Have you been there when your soul is ready to give way? When all around our soul gives way, he then is all our hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may we then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
said, All of your ground is sinking sand. Amen. So tonight we're going to go to God in prayer. And I want to get I want to highlight some prayer requests that are on your sheet. And I want you to bring some quickly, and we're going to take them very quickly and take ask somebody to pray for them. And so, first of all, I, we have the river trip coming up Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It is a time in which about 35 adults and teens will gather and go for canoeing and have spiritual time together. And we need to pray for relationships. We need to pray for, that God would just do a work through the Word and the time together. Who will pray for that tonight? And pray for our teens and their relationships, Dana. Thank God right now. Father in heaven, thank you for making us one in Christ. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to minister to our teens and to go away and get away to study your word and to focus on our relationships, our relationship with you, with one another, and making plans to attack, to attack the lost with the gospel. I pray, Father, for the leaders who are preparing, Pastor Mike especially, and uh, the others who have committed to go, that your word would be effective, minds and hearts would be open. Some, perhaps, Father, some teens will understand the gospel for the first time. We pray that you would do that in the relationships that may be struggling would be healed, maybe because of recognizing a faulty relationship with you and a misunderstanding of the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we've, we've asked and we continue to pray and feel the God answering, though week by week he keeps providing church finances. They have been tight this year, more than the last few years, and so... God wants us to take these and every burden and need to God in prayer. So we'll pray for the provision financially for our church. We'll do that. John, thank you. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you, you own everything. So all the ones in the world belong to you. And, uh, you know the needs of this church and Brother, sisters, the bigger staff, the people who are calling it out, uh, people building the church. So, Father, we pray that we bring them what is needed each week so that your name will be glorified, that your praise will glorify you for mm -hmm. how you take care of us. I pray that. All of us in the congregation would be cheerful givers, yeah. be willful givers, those who love to give to you. Not because we get a tax break, but because we love you and want to serve and help your kingdom grow. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this Sunday, it's on the top sheet of the current events on the on the list here. I am preaching this Sunday. I haven't preached in seven weeks, and I forgot. Would you pray for me? <laughs> um, and and my son Elijah said, Dad, you haven't preached in like seven weeks. Are, are you just ready to give a rip roar and sermon? <laughs> uh, and I don't know, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of pressure here. So would you please pray for me? Uh, God's laid on my heart. This passage in Acts 20, 17 through 38 is listed there. If you want to read through that and pray that for me, pray that for our church, I would appreciate it. Um, so who would pray for us this weekend and pray for me as I preach? Thank you, Roy. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for, for having Daniel in this place, uh, for his leadership, for his love, for you and his zealous giving of his time his knowledge and his heart for your people uh, Lord we just ask that as he comes into the pulpit this weekend Lord that you will stand behind him 
stand in front of him, hide him behind the cross, Lord, and just give him the words to say that that everything that's, that is said, uh, that it is deeply as it's due. Let us not hear his voice, let us hear your voice. And all things to you, thank you, we'll give you thanks, Lord. Pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. And Gordon Lundy was already, Dan mentioned it at the beginning. Our dear brother, Gordon, is on a ventilator. He he wasn't feeling good this weekend, and it just got worse quickly, and they took him to urgent care, and then the urgent care told him to go to the hospital, and his breathing was so bad this morning, and they put him on a ventilator, which was really hard and emotional, and they're not going to keep him on forever, and he's 94, and... So they're praying that he'll heal, his fever will go down, and there was congestion that would clear up. So would you pray for him? He's on antibiotics and other things. And I was with Dorothy today. She's, you guys know her, she's so dear. And she's, I know, she's like, I know Dorothy, Gordon's ready to be with Jesus. I, I, I don't want him to go because I want, I love him. I kind of like him, he's, she said, <laughs> and I want him around. But she goes, I just know God knows what's best, and I just trust him. Is and he awake now? No, he's, he, he was sedated pretty heavily. I tried to talk to him and read to him and all of that, but he didn't seem to. No, I don't know, because couldn't, he couldn't hear us when he was here. God will give him good hearing someday soon. Amen. What a blessing he, he and it was just a week, about a week and a half ago, no, two weeks from ago today, I was here leading prayer, and I couldn't get Barnabas from driver's ed, and Dorothy and Gordon have a hard time coming on Wednesday nights just because of drug nights and all of that, but they went and got Barnabas from work, you know, he, he, he's my, he's been my Uber until two weeks ago <laughs> at 94, um, so we, let's Let's keep. Would you, who would pray for Gordon and Dorothy? God's will to be done, but we do pray for healing. He would be well. Thanks, Paul. Dear Lord, I pray for um, Gordon Monday, Monday, who has a fever um, and has congestion. Um, and because of that, he's on a ventilator as well as antibiotics. Um, I pray that you would, um, if it be your will, that you would, um, that you would cause him to heal. Thank you that he knows the Lord and he knows you and um, we know one another. Amen. Amen. Other prayer requests for Tim that we, we could, you want us to lift up tonight. What do you have? I have more, but I don't I want to take from you now. Yes, Dan? <clears throat> My son has just moved to Baltimore. Yeah. And with his family and they had an offer on their house that failed. So Oh here. Uh, in Virginia. Oh Virginia. So pray for that. Uh, he, he didn't move far away, but so far away that he can't his wife can't she's a she's she, gotten she can't go to the hospital. So they're they're uh, they're looking at two house payments. Uh, right away and right now their house isn't done so they're living in a Airbnb so it's almost like three house payments so Ooh. it's pretty desperate I, I might have to go back to Charlottesville tomorrow to help uh, them okay I, remind us their names Andrew and Emily Andrew and Emily who will pray for them right now Heavenly Father I thank you for our friends Andrew and Emily Pray that you would just provide for them. Pray that you would just provide the right, uh, the right family to buy their house, and uh, pray that you would provide for them financially. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Someone else. While you're thinking of some, we've been praying for Molly's sister, Kristen, who has cancer and had cancer surgery. And has recovered well. She has a pretty intense, long surgery this Monday. Would you pray for Kristen and for the healing that it is reconstruction surgery? And please pray for Kristen and her husband, Derek. We were just with them this week. She's doing great. 
Uh, they seem to be cancer. She seems to be cancer free, and they are missionaries. That they're on. They actually work from a home office. They work for a home office for Action International, and they live in Minneapolis. But who would pray for Kristen right now? Thank you, Jeanette. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, we just thank you, Lord, that um, that you've brought Kristen through the surgery so far, Lord, that you've removed the cancer, Lord, and and that the cancer seems to be um, gone from her body, and now as she um, has reconstruct reconstruction on Monday, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that um, that everything would go well with that, Lord, um, and that uh, she would. Uh, be home soon, and, and just the recovery would go well, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, another prayer request I, I put down, I, I listened to um, Bruce Dunford's sermon Sunday. I don't know if you did, if you were here. I was gone. I was in Minneapolis with Grace at her church, but I on Monday I was able to watch or listen to the sermon. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce is here. Bruce and Debbie are Scott, are Scott and Mike, Mike Dunford's parents, and they're moving up to, to the Prudenville area and New Adventure. And we should pray, though, for God to use the word that was preached on Sunday on unity. Who would, who would do that right now? Especially somebody that was here and remembers the sermon. Would you pray that God would apply that to our lives and to our church? Thank you, Dave. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would grant our church the unity, the kind of unity that Christ prayed for, that his people would be known for their love and, and their unity. And I, I ask that you would cause our church to be united around our common salvation in Jesus as our Savior and Lord our utter dependence on him, that we would be so humble. Mm -hmm. God, nothing that we have, we have on our own, but it's all the gift, our salvation and every every gift, God. May we just be the, the most humble people because we know how dependent we are on, on you. God, may we show humility toward one another, love toward one another. God, give us a common unity around the gospel. Give us a common unity around our commitment to the word of God give us a unity in our, our care for one another and keep us from all forms of division God Satan loves to to attack churches through division God would you guard us from that may we be united because our eyes are on you grant us forgiveness when we wrong one another and grant us peace Christ is our example for all of us. The humility, uh, the love, and uh, the setting aside of our <coughs> desires in order to serve uh, the needs of others. Could you give us this in Jesus' name? Amen. 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 So, another prayer request. And Julia, I would like for you to write this down and put this on a regular request. I, I didn't realize this, but I, I, real, I found this out this week that there's a, yeah. an acquaintance. Oh, His yeah. name is Ryan Corbett. He went to Northland years ago, and he is imprisoned in Afghanistan. He's detained there by the Taliban, and he's been in solitary confinement for a year. And his wife and kids are in New England, and they don't know if they'll ever see their dad and husband again. His name's Ryan. He's a missionary, and he was there to get, more, get some of their business uh, finished off because they were kicked out of Afghanistan bringing the gospel. And we're not supposed to share this on social media um, or on email or other things because it could just make it harder for them in negotiations. Uh, this is what my friend who, he's a, he's a missionary from Bethlehem in Minneapolis. Pray for his release, his family, and their three, kid, their three children. He is mostly in solitary confinement, has very little interaction with anyone. Fit, pray that his faith would remain strong. It was just the one year anniversary of him being in there. And every once in a while, the, seat, the government, State Department is able to get like verification he's still alive. So he sends something and he's been sending like, I'm working on scripture memory. And, but he doesn't have a Bible. 
and he doesn't have anything, and he can't talk to anybody. I, I can't imagine. Um, I have friends who's closer friends. I think your son is, knows Ryan, Bruce. Um, so, so would you? Get, who will pray for Ryan? And we need to start praying for Ryan. Before we pray, think about this. Acts 12, 4 and 5. Dan, do you remember those verses? <laughs> you preached on it a few weeks ago. And when they seized him, Peter, they put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of guards, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. We need earnest prayer to be made to God from the church. Who will pray for Ryan tonight? Somebody that hasn't prayed yet. Scott, thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Ryan's faith, for saving Ryan's faith, Lord. Help his family, help his family. Lord, we just pray that you would um, somehow be with your father, um, bring Ryan home to your family, however that can work out, Lord. And uh, just even though. Thanks for sharing that. Who, let's right now pray for Stacy, who will be the spokesman for our prayer. Will you, Paula? Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring before you Stacy mm -hmm. and the Bass. Pray that you would give her relief, Lord. Draw near to her as mm -hmm. she's in this pain. Pray that uh, she would just heal, Lord, in your precious name we pray. Amen. Is there someone else that has a prayer request? Maybe you've related to your own pain or you know, right now take up to God in prayer. Yeah, go ahead. I just uh, give me a prayer when I, I go down for my colonoscopy on the 14th yeah. and back again for an MRI on my arm on the 17th. Okay. <coughs> okay. Someone would someone pray for that right now for Roy? His colonoscopy and an MRI and some, some concerns he's burdened for and the pain that he is experiencing. Who will pray for Roy? Thank you, Gloria. Dear precious Heavenly Father, we just uh, pray for, for Roy and just the medical issues that he's been having, dear Lord. I just pray uh, that the MRI will go well and they will show the doctors what they need in order to help him and relieve him from the pain. Um, and dear Lord, I just pray for the colonoscopy that he's having that um, it will show the reason why he is having the problems and just Christians? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Who will pray right now for Bruce and Colleen that God would give the grace and the help in this time of suffering and, and for Todd and Daphne who feel even the loss right now? Someone? Thank you, Mary. Who will pray right now for Rhonda? 
Yeah, for the Thank you. Time for one more, and then I'm going to pray. Um, let's keep in keep in mind our our college students from faith that are going to college pretty soon, are in the middle of college. Some of them moving away for college. I think of Ethan Dunford. I think of Riker Levine. Is there any others that you know that are moving away? Those are the two that's to, uh, that I, I know that are. It's a, that's a big deal and pray for their parents. Yeah, Paul? I don't know if it's exactly college or how, or how long, but Kelsey's doing that. Oh, yeah, and, and pray for Kelsey, who's, who is away. And it's, like, it's like college. Yeah. I'm going to pray for them, and I'm going to pray for some other things. Let's bow and let's call out to the Lord. Oh, God, our hope is built on nothing less than... I pray, I pray that it would be. So you purify our faith in nothing less than Jesus, blood and righteousness. Our, we come to you the tonight in his name. We come into you saying, taking the breastplate of righteousness. It is your the righteousness of Christ in which we claim and we thank you. We come with all these burdens from dying loved ones. And to those who are sick and some that are even in this room that are just in pain, those that are in pain emotionally, feeling burdens and weights, oh God, minister to them. Those needing jobs and, and longing for different jobs, those that are looking for houses like the Rondas and those that are, are seeking different ventures, God, would you please minister to them? I pray specifically for our college students and for those that were just mentioned, Kelsey, who's away right now, I think also of Jacob Wentz right now in the Marines. Would you watch over him, protect him, and take care of him? I pray that you'd be with those that will be in school here, like Megan and Sam and Paul and others. I pray that you would just please help them with their school. I pray that you would help Ethan as he goes in a few weeks and then right here after him. Those are big trips and just moving away and that's hard. I pray that you be with their parents as well. I pray that you bless them in this time. God, I, I pray that you would help us as a church, our marriages, would you please grow them and strengthen them. Our, our, our singles and our whether they be divorced, whether they be older and widowed or widowers, would you minister to them in a special way? God, I pray that you would be with Paul Witt, my friend, whose can a, a new form of cancer has hit him. Would you minister to him and come near to him? Thank you that you've used changes and time of meditation for Jan. That's been a blessing. Please continue to help Deb Mundy. I pray for Steve Spencer. Would you sustain him and help him with his dialysis? And I pray, I know he wants to serve you. I pray that he would. I pray for Jim Thompson's grandfather to be saved. That reminds us there are so many people we know that are unsaved. Oh God, from children or grandchildren, people that come week in and week out at Faith Church, I pray that they would be drawn to you and they would be saved. I pray that you would grant them repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help us to be a faithful evangelist and people that pray for them and push them to you. I pray, God, that we would bear forth gospel fruit by being evangelists. I pray that I would as a pastor. I pray that week by week as I preach, including this Sunday, and then in the Gospel of John, I would show forth Christ as the only treasure, the only portion of any human soul that's worth giving themselves to and is the only salvation. I pray that we would at Faith Church see and savor Jesus Christ and in so doing, bring him to others as you equip us and help us. God, we are going to, the parents are going to meet in just a few minutes with the teens and with the youth ministry to talk about this coming trip. And I pray that you would help Pastor Mundy. 
to be said. I pray that you would help that trip to go so well as we've already prayed. I pray that you would help the dynamic of teens that, that is sometimes awkward and hard and immature. And I pray that you would please help the, the girls to love each other, the guys to love each other, the older to be mature leaders and godly and faithful. God, would you bring a revival in our teens? Would you bring a revival with our singles, our young adults? Would you bring a revival in our seniors? Would you bring a re revival in the parents, the parents of teens and of little ones? Would you bring a revival in our church of all the members? I pray that if there are any members who are not saved, even though they profess to be, that you'd bring them to the reality that they have not repented of their sins and they would do so. Oh God, I pray that you would help us as we go. Help us to fellowship well by your Holy Spirit. Thank you. I pray that you'd use these booklets that are going to be read. I pray that you would take the word that's read the rest of this week. And I pray that you would it'd be so rich and meaningful. We would meditate on the truths that Dan has taught us tonight. Help us as we gather for three more weeks in Ephesians and finish it out Ephesians in August. I pray that you would guide and direct us in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.